Well, one of the most interesting and rewarding elements of doing the second edition, I think, for uh, we three authors uh, was the preparation of a new chapter, an entirely new chapter on international law and organization. And the central uh, question that we address uh, uh, in large part in that chapter is uh, do international organizations and does international law uh, promote uh, peace, justice, and prosperity in the world system? And that's an important question, it's an enduring question uh, that goes back uh, several hundred years and we were very happy uh, to address that issue. And John, what do you think we, where do you think we ended with that uh, issue and what do you think? Well, I think the fact that we've written a new chapter that focuses on international law and organization means that we think it's important. Uh, and uh, the core question really is of that chapter, what is the impact? What are the roles or uh, 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 ways in which international law and institutions work their way into world politics? Is it a positive uh, phenomenon? Does it do things that wouldn't exist uh, if those institutions and if international law weren't in, in, in place? Uh, I'll make the case that, that uh, they are very important, uh, that we look around us and we see a world that's increasingly uh, tied together through economic interdependence, through uh, connections of ideas, people, trade, commerce, capital, and in, a, in such a world where people of different nation states, different societies are so deeply connected, um, the uh, natural uh, way of trying to organize that and to both facilitate the good things that come from exchange and interdependence and mitigate against the dangers from that uh, is through various kinds of cooperation. So you have a demand for cooperation, you have a, a incentives for cooperation, and then the question is how do you go about uh, organizing that uh, uh, cooperation, and that brings us to international law and institutions. So I would say international law and institutions don't cause peace or cause order or cause of the world to be better, but they are tools by which states and other kinds of actors can work together to uh, create the infrastructure, if you will, for governance, for organizing their common lives. Um, and one can kind of think of that as we do in the chapter with various levels in which international law and institutions play a role. At the most simple level, if you think about the world around you, uh, there are demands for, uh, we'll call it functional cooperation, organizing the time zones, organizing shipping uh, zones, uh, standards for uh, communication and travel, all of those things that just simply are needed as coordination of complex interrelationships. But building on that, more sophisticated forms of cooperation embedded in laws that, em that uh, uh, embody values and, va and purposes that states are trying to achieve through cooperation. The WTO uh, is a uh, uh, World Trade Organization is, is definitely uh, at the top of most people's list as a very important global institution that helps states coordinate trade facilitate flows and uh, provide mechanisms for dispute resolution when things go bad. Mike, uh, what are your thoughts and reflections having uh, played such an important role in the uh, construction of that chapter in terms of the role of international law and organizations? Well, I think I'd agree with the essential point John's making that laws and organizations are important parts of world politics. I think we have to be careful not to overemphasize them for the following reason, and that is that unlike domestic laws, international laws and organizations uh, are as strong as the commitment of the states behind them, and in some ways they're a reflection of the interests and power of those states. Uh, students will learn about uh, the 1930s in our textbook, and one of the problems of the 1930s is perhaps that states relied a little too much on international laws and organizations, hoping that they might be able to keep a peace that states themselves weren't necessarily willing to keep. Uh, so if you think about international laws and organizations 
that way you can see a potential danger where there's a sense of over-reliance. And we, we talk in the textbook about another issue, a more contemporary issue, which is the responsibility to protect. Uh, there's an emerging consensus in the international community uh, that governments that are abusing their own peoples uh, should be uh, taken to task by other states and by the international community as a whole. But the record of the international community in actually carrying out that obligation, that responsibility to protect, is very mixed. Uh, good in some cases, not so good in others. You can think of the current war in Syria as an example. So I think we have to have a sort of qualified and balanced view that international laws and organizations are a critical part of the international relations infrastructure, but they are not a substitute for the kind of power and interest-based cooperation that must be generated by the states in the system, or if you will, in the international society. Uh, thank you. For my part, I teach an undergraduate course and have done so for a number of years on international law and organizations. And I tell the students, uh, as I've mentioned to you, that I uh, come to the question of what is the impact of international law and organizations and world politics as a respectful skeptic. I share some of the uh, 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 ideas that Mike has expressed regarding the uh, likelihood that uh, the content of international law in terms of uh, prescriptions and proscriptions on behavior and the responsibilities assigned to international organizations and their overall efficacy is likely to reflect uh, the interests of the, especially the most powerful states within that are uh, participating in the construction of, of such law, for example, arms control agreements, or international labor standards, and in the day-to-day -day operations and oversight of these international organizations. The reason why I've become more uh, aware of the significance of international organizations is that uh, there is the possibility that when states decide what it is that they wish to place in an international law, the kinds of rights and obligations they wish to express through international law and organizations, yes, those rights and obligations uh, reflect their interests. But in calculating and estimating their interests, mm -hmm. they may take into account what they think other important countries will be doing. And insofar as that, the behavior of others becomes a part of one's own estimation of interests and feasible pathways to the future, uh, agreements and organizations to implement agreements may affect one's, uh, one state's perceptions of what's possible for its own uh, interest, and thus international law and organizations in that way can play a role. I think you're becoming a liberal. I'm becoming a, <laughs> I have become a respectful skeptic. <laughs> However, good. one last thing. I think Mike makes a very important point that why the concern on the part of many scholars not to overestimate uh, the potentialities of international law and organizations. And I do think it reflects a fear born of the horrible experiences of the 1930s, the failure uh, to uh, react quickly enough to the fascists and Nazis and imperialists uh, to prevent the onset of World War II. That, I think, is, is, is very telling, Michael. Thank you.